said. What are we going to study today? One word. All right. Uh, it starts with L, but it's not the law. Love. You see, some people see the Ten Commandments. I see love. All right. What was the scripture? What does the scripture? What did the scripture reading say today? If you love me, do what? You cannot keep the commandments of God unless you love Him, because it's God who gives us the power to keep His commandments. So it bothers me when I hear individuals say, we should stop talking about the commandments and just talk about love. Okay, let's stop talking about the commandments. Let's talk about love. All right? You cannot talk about love without the commandments. Now, before we start, and I will pray for our brother Jim. My wife called me down to um, let me know that. Um, I guess the message was passed on to her that Jim is ill. He's in the hospital. And so we want to pray for him. So as we go through today, just say silent prayers for our brother Jim, because you know he would be up here leading us in song. Let us pray. Father, as we come before you, first I want to present myself to you as a living sacrifice. Father, I ask that you would take my will and put in me your will. Remove my words and give me your words. Lord, help that everything I say today will be for your name's honor and glory. Remove from me the things that I want to say and you speak. Then, Lord, before we go into this study, we pray that you would go by the side of our brother Jim. You would touch him, Lord. You would confound the medical profession. You would heal him. And so, Father, that we would see him once again doing what he loves to do, worshiping you in songs. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are going to talk about love. And as I mentioned, and the scripture says, John 14, 15, this is Jesus himself speaking. These are the words of Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus again in Matthew 22 Verses 37 through 40. He wanted to ensure that we understood that his commandments are about love. He said, thou shalt love the Lord with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Then he goes on and he says, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love whom? Thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says something that's very profound that we know. He says, on these two commandments hang all, not some, all the law and the prophets. And all Jesus was doing is referencing the Ten Commandments as given to Moses. All right? So, let's, um, let's begin. I'm stuck. All right, there we go. So as I was preparing this study, and by the way, you will need your Bible, okay? You know, uh, my brother Winston, who delivered a powerful message last week, said that one of the things that I talk about is study. I have told you in the past that God gave me one job, and I tried to do it to the best of my abilities, and that is to tell people to study the Word of God. If we do not study, we can't know who Jesus is. We don't know who we are. We don't know how we are to relate to Jesus. We don't know anything about anything. You know, I'm a finance guy. And my, my wife will tell you that the best financial advice I get is found in the Bible. When I do financial consulting, if you're not willing to hear about the Bible, mommy, I can't help you. Because that's where I come from. Yes, I may have studied in colleges, but the best financial advice I know comes from the Bible. Everything you want to know about, there's a principle in the Bible. But I was studying, and the Holy Spirit led me to this passage in Christ's object lessons. Very important one, right? Many of you may know this, right? So I'm just catching up to where you are says, the man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of what? Obligation merely. See, many of us, we try to keep the commandments out of obligation. 
won't happen. She's, she continues, she says, she says, because he is what? Required to do so. You know, it's funny how sometimes, oh, I have to go to church Sabbath. Really? Oh, but man, I'm going to church Sabbath. Do you, do you know how lonely it is when you come here and you're preaching the word of God, doing a study, and your friends are not here with you? Talk about small groups. Sometimes we need a little bigger group. <laughs> you need some encouragement from the bigger group. But just like Moses' father-in-law, Jethro gave him advice way back when to split up the big group into smaller groups. We need those small groups. But sometimes as a big group, we need to come together, right? Continue, she says, if we do so out of obligation, if we do so because we feel like we're required to do so, Notice what I underscored. We'll never enter into the joy of obedience. Are we joyful when we uh, obey? When we obey God. Are we joyful? You see, when we obey God, it should not be, man, I have to. It was like, man, I get to. I get to be obedient to the God of the universe. All right, so... We will begin our study. What is the first commandment? Summarize it quickly for me. Just say, we shouldn't do what? Any gods before God, right? So you need you have your Bibles, right? Okay, you're going to help me out. So I'll give you the scripture. So we'll start with a preamble, right? In Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. And the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God. That did what? Brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? Bondage. All of us were in bondage. Every single one of us were, and some of us are still in bondage to some form of sin. Yes, you may not have been in literal Egypt, but when we think of Egypt, we think of a lot of sin. All kind of mess was going on in, in Egypt. They were worshipping false gods. They were doing all kind of things that they had no business doing. And then verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, let's look at some of the gods we have. All right? Some of us, we like to be honored. Have you ever been around some folks? Don't call out anybody's name. If you don't greet them every time, they get upset. You know what my title is? My name is Carol Brown. You should say hello every time. Right, Carol? <laughs> now, Carol would never say that. You see, now listen, if I pick on you, you know I love you, right? <laughs> and then the rest of you, I love you too, but I don't have enough time to pick on you. All right? Then some of us, you know, what is this? Computer, screen, TV, whatever. That's our God. No, I'm not saying you can't watch good things, these things. But we're watching all kind of messed up stuff. You know, right now, and I do get some clips on YouTube to see what's going on in the country I live. So I, I, I watch both sides, what's going on on both sides of the, the, the island, as, a, as it were. And, but some people are so, it, politics have taken over their lives. You know, my brother Chris and I were talking the other day, and he said some of the things he's seeing on Facebook from Seventh day Adventist. They sound like they're ready to kill somebody over politics. You know, one of the commandments that we'll talk about later said, Thou shalt not kill. But the way they're talking, they're killing people by their words, right? So that's one. Oh, the mighty dollar, right? Nothing stronger than the US dollar. Well, there are the actually dollars stronger, but you get some US dollars. Man, you know, we, 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 we do everything. That's where I was in, right? My wife will tell you. I, I worked hard, you know, for two things. I didn't want so much money, but I know I needed money. But I wanted to be respected, but not the way people say. Respected from the standpoint of the education I got, right? Not that people should bow down to me, but that I could elevate myself. And so... For years, this and this occupied my life. They are gods. I'm not saying we don't need money. You have rent to pay, you have mortgages to pay, you have to buy food, or you could plant food, so you have to buy the food you plant, right? Okay, better. 
and success. Here's another one of mine. So I'm going to talk about me. You don't mind me talking about me, right? I don't want you to think I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. So success, I had to achieve. It's funny, I would never go to school on the Sabbath. I would never study on the Sabbath. I would go to church. But the next six days, Madge, you can touch me. I was studying. You know how many times I forfeited meeting with friends and things because I had to study to be successful, right? So be careful. Success is okay in the context of what God wants us to have, right? And then there are many. Now, do you know? Here's one now that, uh, unfortunately, this one is not mine, so it may be somebody's families. Do you know some of us sin against God because we place our families above God? Oh, yes. You know, we have elements of our family that get upset with me and my wife because they will have all these things, you know, they'll have different things on the Sabbath where they're celebrating family and we said, well, we, why don't you do it on another day? Because on this day, on God's day, we're going to elevate God and worship God and God alone. And when we show up, we, when we do not show up to these things, people get upset with us because they think the family should come first. The family comes first within the context of God. God first and then, right? And there are other things, right? And then there are other leaders and games and, oh, here's one. We love music, but be very careful. Be very careful. All right. What is the second commandment? What is the second commandment? Thou shalt not do what? Graven images. Right. Now, the second commandment, it is a little longer. Right. So it goes from Exodus um, 24 through 6. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is where? In heaven above or in the earth below or in the water under the earth. All right. Now, that's kind of the preamble. We shouldn't make them to do what? Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a what type of God? Jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the ch upon the children unto how many gen generations? The third and fourth generation. Of whom? Them that hate me. You see, what happens here, friends, we have something called DNA. Right? I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a medical profession. But I know, just like I have passed on some good things to my children, I passed on some negative things to my children. My parents have done the same. My grandparents have done, and their parents have done. And that's why it's so important that if we practice to Love God, to keep his commandments, to create, to develop good habits. We would then help our, uh, our ancestors, not ancestors. The, the, what, what is that term? Not the ancestors. Descendants, right? They good stuff. No, it's not, it doesn't mean everything bad will come from them. Like my, my dad, before he was a Seventh-day Adventist, he used to drink and smoke. I don't do those things. Uh, you know, drink alcoholic beverages. You know, I do drink water and juice. Right? But alcoholic beverages and smoke cigarettes and other unmentionable uh, things. Yeah. You may hallucinate if you... Right? But he then... But here's how good... You want me to show you how good God is? Before I tell you how good God is, let's read verse 6. And showing what? Mercy unto how many? Thousands of them who do what? Love me and keep my commandments. Let me show you the love of God to my dad. My dad is smoking. He's drinking. And my mom trying to be a loving wife, you know. Well, they, they didn't used to go to church. But what she'd do, she's like, you know what? I'd prefer if you drink or smoke at home so you don't, you know, pass out on the street somewhere. So she would send her, her kids, she didn't know any better, go buy the cigarettes and the alcohol. In Jamaica, even though there's an age 16 limit, it's not enforced. You know, I was buying cigarettes and alcohol from I could walk, pretty much. And so he would. When my dad got baptized, no joke, 
My dad got baptized and said, you know what? No more. No more. My dad never smoked cigarette after that or drink alcoholic beverages after. God is a loving God. Took it away from him. Now, just so you think my dad did this for five years, my dad started smoking and drinking alcohol when he was in his teenage years. And he got baptized in the middle, in his mid-40s. These are years of abuse to the system. And God loved him so much that he grabbed it and just threw it away. Burn it up like it never existed. You and I need to have faith that whatever we are going through, we have a loving God that can remove these things from us. So what is the third commandment? Shall not take the name, the God, um, God's name in vain, right? It says, thou shall not take the, take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for God will not hold him, what? Guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Do you know how some of us take God's name in vain? We actually call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves Christians, and when individuals see us, they're like, you're a Christian? Do you know, because we misrepresent God, we chase people from God. Not just the church, from God himself. Because they're not studying, and we are supposed to be studying. And then when we say we're Christians and we behave worse than worldlings, worse than heathens, then they say, if that's who Christ is, why would I want to be like Christ? And so we take God's name in vain and we find that in Exodus 20 verse 7. Yes, some of us even use Christ's name as a curse word. We have to exclaim, we use God's name. Don't misuse God's name, friends. God's name is holy. Holy. Whenever we call on, use God's name, we should be calling on God for some reason not to use his name as a curse word. All right, let's keep going. What is the fourth commandment? We should all know that one, right? So you shouldn't have to look in your Bible for that one. It says what? Remember the Sabbath day to do what? Keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of man. Oh, the Lord thy God. And the Bible tells us that we should not do any work. Who? Just us? Who else? Our son, our daughter, our manservant, our maidservant, our cattle. Or our stranger that is within thy gates. We'll come back to that. Um, to that stranger. For six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is and did what? Rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and holiday. But let's go back to our strangers. So a stranger in this context is someone who does not live in your house normally. Okay? So my wife and I and, you know, our family that we live with, you know, we all live together, six of us. So we are the household. Let's another family member visit. That's kind of a stranger to the household. When we're in church on Sabbath, where should that person be? In church on Sabbath. Yes. Okay. You know, I would. Uh, there were times in different churches that I have served. Uh, I'd have individuals come to me and say, "Pray for my son or my children or my daughter." And I said, "I will do that." But I said, "But how effective is that prayer going to be?" And they said, "What do you mean?" I said, I'm going to pray. But where's your son, your daughter, your children? Oh, they're at home. I said, uh, uh, who's home? My home? I say, you're the adult and they're at your home. And you're at church. So it seems like they're the adults. They send you to church and they stay home to watch TV and play video games and do whatever else they want to do. Friends, when we have people that we invite or even our people that live in the home... We have to be careful that people are not breaking God's Sabbath and we are, we are letting it go for peace sake or to win, use, you know, my wife used the word unity and win kind of expounded on it, for unity sake or peace sake. 
There are times when unity cannot exist because people are in going in different ways. You and I can't say we are unified if one thinks A is A and the other one thinks A is B. Doesn't make sense, right? So we need to be careful that we think we're keeping the Sabbath, but then everybody else in our household not. Now, let's take the other one. Let's say you live in someone's household and you're keeping the Sabbath. If this is not your household, you can't force these people to do anything. So what you do, you encourage them by your lifestyle. Okay? If you're a child in that household and your parents or the adults are not living, you know what? Just ask them to give you your space to do that. Encourage them to join with you in worship. Encourage them to come to church. But you can't force them to do so. But if this is your household, somebody got to go. Or they need to step up. And do because this is God will hold us responsible. One of you know one of our children, our daughter, um, left our household early because she did not want to obey the laws of God. And we remind her that the car she drove, the house she, the room she lives in, that doorknob she turns, everything belongs to God. And so you have to. Step up and live according. So she left and went to other family members who were tolerant of sinful behaviors. Did we love? Of course we love our daughter. I mean, we have a much better relationship now. But there was a time when the relationship wasn't there. Not because we didn't want to have one. Because everything we did was based on the context of loving God first. And some of us are going to have to sacrifice some relationships. Because when you have to choose between your children or your family members and God, God has to be chosen. All right? All right, let's keep going. I want to read something because, you know, I'm not going to even comment on this. I'm just going to read it. And the Holy Spirit, I was praying about these ne in these next few slides. And the Holy Spirit said, just read it. And it will hit whom it needs to hit. It will encourage. It will, whatever it is, right? It will speak to us as we need to. It says, the law forbids what kind of labor? Secular labor on the rest day of the Lord. The toil that gains a livelihood must do what? Cease. No labor for worldly pleasure or profit is lawful upon that day. Trust me, I want to comment, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut like the Holy Spirit said. It says, but as God sees his labor of creating and rested upon the Sabbath and blessed it, no man is to, uh, so man is to leave the occupations of his daily life and devote those sacred hours to what? Helpful rest, not during when you should be at church, by the way. Okay, helpful rest. To what? Worship and to holy deeds. Now, again, keep quiet, Pissar. And to holy deeds. I almost broke the promise to God. Now, in another of her writings, that's found in, you know, medical missionary work, you know, a longer name on medical ministry, she said, physicians need to cultivate a spirit of what? Self-denial and Self-sacrifice. All right. She goes on. She says, it may be necessary to devote even the hours of the Holy Sabbath to the relief of suffering humanity. Not done yet. All right. He says, but the fee for such labor should be put into the treasury of the Lord to be used for the worthy poor who need medical skill but cannot afford to pay for it. Amen. All I will say is, my wife is a medical professional. Is that all right? Okay? So this goes for her too. So again, we need to be careful to keep God's holy uh, Sabbath holy because it is holy. What is the fifth commandment? Honor whom? Honor thy mother and thy father. That what? 
that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The only commandment with overt promise. Right? And the reason I said overt promise, because friends, if we love God and we keep his commandments, we have a great promise. We will be with him forever. Right? And, and ever. All right. You know, and ever. Now, in um, Ephesians 6, 1, uh, Paul then, through under inspiration, and all, we know the Bible is inspired, uh, all the Bible is inspired, under inspiration, Paul kind of helps us with this. He says, children, obey your parents. How? In the Lord. For this is what? Right. So what does that say to you? Do you remember your English teacher telling you to read between the lines? So it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And, you know, my Mrs. Reed, you know, no, Miss Reed, she never got married. She, you know, we would tell her she got too educated too fast and some men are intimidated, you know. Plus she was a tall, stately lady, about 6'5", and carried herself well. And we like, you know, we would talk. And I said, you know why you're not married? You intimidate men by your education and the way you carry yourself, you know. And she would tell us, Dean, read between the lines. You don't understand what I'm saying. And I'm like, okay, well, let's read between the lines. If you're looking in your Bible, if the Bible says children obey your parents in the Lord, what is it telling us to do also? If your parents tell you something outside of the Lord, we have a right, a biblical right to not obey in the Lord. Now, that may mean you won't get whooped upon. Oh, I'm not. Hey, listen, I, I'm just telling you. When we do things according to the will of God, we put ourselves in some dangerous places. You and I are getting ready. We're in a time when we say that we love God and we're going to keep his commandments, that we're going to be in some dangerous places. Some of us have these nice, cushy jobs. When they tell us, come to work on the Sabbath, and we say, you know, as respectfully, you could be lying on your face, which you shouldn't do. So, but I'm just trying to tell you, you could be doing it the nicest, most respectful way when you say, I cannot do that because that's a violation of God's holy Sabbath. You will lose your job. Friends, as time moves and it's moving faster and faster, it's going to get worse. We're going to be thrown in prison. We're going to have to die. Some of us, not all of us, because there is going to be a remnant who continues to preach and teach the word of God through the time of trouble, the, the small time of trouble, that is. Because the great time of trouble, when the plagues are falling, no more. No more preaching, no more. Right? Don't bind this foolishness about Christ is going to come and then there's going to be a time, the, the rapture thing, right? So let me say, some of us are going to face some tough times, right? All right. What is the sixth commandment? Thou shalt not what? It's, it's a vicious. Don't, don't kill. Murder. And it really means to commit murder. Right? The sixth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill or commit murder. When you look at the Greek, it tells you that it's specifically talking about committing murder. But Jesus helped us out. Because we commit murder in other ways. In Matthew 5, verse 21, Jesus is expounding on some of the commandments in Matthew chapter 5. And so in verse 21 of Matthew 5, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not what? Kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Hold on to that word. Judgment shall be in danger of the judgment. Then in verse 22, he says, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. Jesus equated being angry with our brother. I left out a word, I apologize. Angry with our brother without a cause. Now some version says just cause, but the King James Version says without a cause. Now the verse goes on and says that whosoever calls his brother, uh, uh, says to his brother Raka, and the word Raka in, is a Greek word, but in English it means 
we call someone an empty-headed one, like, like saying the person is doesn't have any sense. Uh, they shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say unto his brother, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. But we want to focus about being angry with our brother without a, co without a cause. And I know that without a cause, give us a room we think to treat our brothers and sisters a certain way or to go back at them. But remember in Luke chapter 23, in fact, go there with me, please, please. You have your Bibles, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, or you have a, a Bible like this that you're flipping through. Go to Luke chapter 23. We're just going to read one phrase. We're not reading the entire thing. I want you to, to remind you that it's in the Bible. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus is being crucified because he loves people. You tell me, what did Jesus do to die such a terrible death? He came to show us love for God and love for man. He came to show us how to live. And so Jesus is being crucified. You think somebody has a just cause or has a cause. And here's what Jesus says. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We think we have a cause to be angry with each other. Now, the Bible doesn't say we can't get angry, but I would, I would err on the side of try not to get angry. Because the Bible also tells us, be angry and do what? Sin not. Now, here's how Jesus tells us to handle ourselves when people mistreat us. By the way, that's for Carol, my friend, you know? Um, she's looking forward to go to heaven to, to, to play with the animals, hang out with them. And we were like, Carol, it's prayer time, you know? <laughs> She'll be hanging out with the animals. All right, in Matthew 5, 44, in Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, but I say unto you, love your friends. <laughs> Frenemies, right? Love your enemies. Bless them that do what? Curse you. Do good to them that what? Hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus was telling us, you want to know how to treat people who mistreat you? By the way, when it says despitefully use, it means to abuse you. Look up the word. I don't remember the Greek word, but if you go look it up, it means to abuse you. And somebody might be thinking like, well, yeah, that's harder to, yes, it is harder, right, to do than to say. But God went through all that and more. God, the second person of the Godhead in the name of Jesus Christ, who is also called Michael the Archangel, went through worse than what he's asked us to do. Just because he loves us so much. We need to get to the point when people are abusing us, we see a child of God who needs love. It's not easy. But just like when you're trying to build muscles, you know, I mean, let's say you take a, a, a scrawny version of me, right? Yeah, I used to, when my wife met me, I was a lean, mean machine of about 122 pounds. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and then now I'm like 145, right? But when I was trying to put on weight, man, stop laughing at your brother. You know, I belong to an elders group. We could, you know. <laughs> so... When I was putting on my, did you think I went and grabbed 50 pounds on each arm and start curling? Of course not. You know, I started off with probably the 10 pound weights, you know, because uh, I never used to lift weights in Jamaica. I used to just work and I ride my bicycle. I played soccer. I ran track. So I stayed fit, right? But when I wanted to put on muscle, I started off small. And then I started, you know, getting more weights on and more weights. But then... After a while, I was up there with the big boys and they're like, man, how come you curling so much? How come you pushing so much? It was hard work, right? But here's the cool thing. I was doing that in my strength. When you allow God to work out his will in your life, you will love people in his strength. You now have God on your side. It's not you fighting to love people. It's you saying to God, every day I die to self. 
Like Paul says, I died to self. You take over my will. You be it. So when people mistreat you, you can still love them. When people abuse you, you could still be saying to them, you know what, man, here's what the Bible said. Not to protect yourself, you know, you need to love God. Don't you want to live forever? And I know it seems counterintuitive. Why would you want someone who is mistreating other people to live forever? No, no, no. They're not going to live forever in that state. We're trying to get them to love God. And then when they love God, they will love you. They will love others. Friends, if, if you don't remember any verse, please remember this one. Because this is the one that has been bothering us and ripping our country apart because people feel like we have to fight back and fight back worse. Right? So we need to be very careful. What is the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not do what? Not steal yet. That's not, 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 it comes before that. I have a wife. If someone looks at my wife funny, commit adultery. Now, you know, it, it, she's a beautiful woman, so people may want to look at her, but I'm going to help them out a little bit. So in Matthew, uh, Exodus 20, verse 14, the Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus again helped us out. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, he said that ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. He doesn't get rid of it. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, I know that was done from the male perspective. Yes, women, if you look at a man with lust in your heart, you're committing adultery also. So Jesus didn't say that we should, he's not saying it's the physical action, you know, not just that. He's saying that, yes, but you, it happens where? Do you think adultery just happens when the physical act takes place? No, people are thinking about these things. You know you are, you put yourselves, we put ourselves in situation, you start thinking about it, you know, my sister, <laughs> Linda, um, she, she sometimes watches our, um, uh, our grandchild, uh, Micah, and he will be doing something. I said, Micah, don't tempt yourself. <laughs> and that is so true. We do that. We know we ought not to be certain places. We know that we, the devil, one of the things that the devil uh, besets us with is a particular thing. And we put ourselves in the place to be tempted. You know, we should be careful, right? So we have adultery. All right, how about the eighth commandment? You said it earlier. Thou shalt not steal. All right, so let's look at stealing. Thou shalt not steal. So on the left, it says, will a man rob God? So let's address that. Because on the right side, stealing chips or whatever they're stealing, you know, um, we know we shouldn't steal. But let's address it from God's perspective. How do we rob God? The Bible tells us in that Malachi 3, verses 8, and then, so we rob God in tithes and offering. Because there are some individuals who return tithe faithfully. I'm not, listen, do not go blame your treasurer. I know this for a fact, not necessarily in this church, but in other churches where I used to be an assistant treasurer. And I am telling you, there were people who turn in tithes faithfully but not one penny of offering. The Bible says we rob God. When they question God, God says, you rob me in tithes and offering. And verse 9, he says, you are cursed with a curse because you have robbed me this entire nation. But you know another way we rob God, friends? Unfortunately, time. Do we all have 24 hours in a day? Yes, but we rob God time. We rob God because we do not put time studying, put in time studying the Word of God. You know, especially during this time when some of us are working from home, 
we don't have to commute an hour to work. You know, I'm back at work. I'm commuting to work. I work Mondays to Thursdays, which is great. You know, I don't have to worry about trying to get out of work quickly, you know, on Friday because I'm at home. But some of us are still at home. We need to be putting in more time. Because when we are, we are, God has blessed us that we can still work from home, but we have to, but we don't have the commute time. That's more time to give to God. Get off the television for a while. Get, you know, get away from that Facebook thing for a while. Spend some time in the word of God for yourself. Because even if you're watching sermons online, learn the word of God for yourself. Don't let other people tell you what to think, right? I'm not saying that's not good. That's good stuff to listen to people that you trust and they're they're teaching from the word of God, but study yourself. I think last week I told you I was struggling with the book of Zechariah and I'm hoping you have been praying for me. I'm going to trust you've been praying for me because I've been praying and I started studying again and it's being opened to my mind, right? When you ask God to give you wisdom in our understanding his words, he give it to you. I'm not telling you I, I, I know Zachariah so well. I'm on chapter 4 because I keep fighting with it. You know, one of my sisters says, doesn't it, it, the, the prophet said to fight with it? Yes, I'm fighting with it. And God is opening up the book of Zechariah to me. Right? I just didn't used to understand those messages. But again, friends, don't steal. Don't steal ever. Madge, you had something? Oh, who, oh, win. Now, I saw your hand go up, Madge, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, win. All right. All right, so win is correct. Many have this misunderstood notion that the tithe can be used. No, no. God set up our system of worship. And the guidance that came down from the prophet is the tithe is used for pastoral work and those in certain functions. It, it helps pays, um, and I studied this. I, I had to in a little bit more detail because I was working with a church. Well, I still work with the finance committee of another church. Uh, they bring me in as an outside consultant. And I was, you know, we did a one and a half hour session through the Zoom, you know, online. And I had to explain to folks and read passages that it is not, you can't just use the tithe for the local work. That's not what it's there for. The, the, the offering is what takes care. Thanks, Wayne. The offering is what takes care of here. But you know, if we would just be faithful to God, we would never have to ask for money. You know that? Never. Well, you know, um, it is. You know, I, I, the way I see this is pray. You know how, and I think I may have mentioned this, you know how I do offering? I, I, have prayed to, I prayed to God a number of years ago, and I said, just put a number in my head. And I do not care what that number comes out. I will tell you this. The number is always more than I would have done. But I don't question it, because Linda, if I can't buy some food, God go after to bring me some, right? I'm going to take care of his place first, right? So anyway, we need to be very careful. All right. The ninth commandment, stop lying. What does it say? Thou shalt not what? Bear false witness against thy neighbor. Friends, we're not going to hold on to this. Be careful what we say. You know, let's just stop lying, especially it says against thy neighbor. Don't lie on our neighbors, which we're all neighbors. I know we're family, we're friends, but we're neighbors too, right? Then the tenth commandment, what does it say? We should not covet. Do you know I believe that that covetous thing that is, I believe God had a reason to drop that one there because that is so interesting in that if we look back on many of the sins we commit on breaking the other commandments, it generally starts with being covetous. It generally starts with being covetous. And it says, thou shalt not covet what? 
thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything. You know what anything means? Everything else that was not said. Friends, let me say this. You and I, it's imperative that we keep the commandments, but we can only do so out of love. So I'm going to wrap up with a, last, a few more verses. And what we're going to talk about is the imperative of keeping God's commandments. So my question here is, why is it imperative we keep the commandments? There are so many reasons, but I am going to share just a few with you. All right, so what does this verse talk about? You have a hint. Sin. What does 1 John 3, 4 say? Whosoever committed sin does what? Transgress at the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So the, uh, right, we make a choice, right? So here's the deal. The first one I want to remind you of is that when we do not keep the law of God, we commit sin. When we keep the law of God, we are obedient, so we do not commit sin. All right, there's another one. Who knows what Romans 7, 12? This is Paul talking about the law and the commandment, and he said the law and the commandment are what? Holy, just, and good. You understand? So if the law and the commandments holy, just, and good, why wouldn't we want to keep it? If it's holy, just, and good, do you know it takes a holy people to keep a holy law? But for us to be holy, we need to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors as ourselves, right? Let me read something for you. Because when I read this in Spirit of Prophecy, it was bothersome. But you know why it's bothersome? Because I see it happening. So she says, and this is in testimonies to ministers and so forth. It says, when the shaking comes, by the way, the shaking is going on. It's going to get more aggressive. It says, when the shaking comes, by the introduction of false theories, these surface readers anchored nowhere are like shifting sand. You know, when in Sabbath school mentioned earlier that there are certain things he would not go along with that some members in different parts of our churches are doing. And we have to be careful to discern that which is biblical from not. There are a lot of false theories being spread. She goes on. She says, they slide into any position to sue the, ter the tenor of their feelings of bitterness. Friends, I know we have all known individuals who have been bitter at one time or another because all you have to do is just look in the mirror and you will see that individual looking right back at you right let's not be the person who says it should have been me you know you know that um head deaconess position it should have been me well i should back off because a lot of people don't want that position they think it's too hard <laughs> um, let's give another one Singing up front, that should have been me. Yes, it may be, but for whatever reason, you, you don't have the right attitude and God has chosen that. That's not what you do right now. I'm working on you. But there could be other things, you know. I, I should have been here. I should have this or whatever. Let's not do that, right? So we need to be careful. But here's what got to me. Uh-oh, that's a little light. I apologize. So, But I'm reading for you anyway says, not, this comes from testimonies for the churches, right? And it's also in last day events. Now, whenever I use last day events, which is a compilation of um, different books, I always at least show the original, right? Or at least one of the original. It says, not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy. Friends, not only are we to study the word of God, which is true, Jesus said that what John 17 17 sanctify them by thy truth thy word is true right not only are we to love the truth right or, or read the truth we need to love the truth because if we don't we'll be taken in the delusions of the enemy she goes on she says they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith 
So when I read that, I said, all right, I know I found that, I read that somewhere in the Bible. And I found it, right? Whenever you see something and you want to verify, go back to the Bible. In 1 Timothy 4.1. Please go to 1 Timothy 4.1 for me. Please, I want you to see what she was commenting on. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Towards the, you know, the New, the, the, the New Testament. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh, how? Expressly. What will happen? What is the Spirit saying? That in the latter times, what will happen? Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Friends, be careful who you're listening to. Be very careful who we listen to. Because there are many, you know, I wish I had time to talk to you about Desmond Ford. And how many... Desmond Ford, uh, someone who was big time in the Seventh-day Adventist movement, have led many astray that they are the fiercest critics of the Seventh-day Adventist because of things that he has said, right? So we need to be extremely careful. So we don't want to be led away from God. We want to continue to live holy lives. You know, it's imperative we keep the commandments. And then Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Famous passage by the, 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 the wise man that became unwise, but then came back to God. As Solomon said in 12, 13, what? Let us hear the what? Conclusion of the whole matter. Do what? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty, not part duty, the whole duty of man. We, it's imperative we keep God's commandments because it's our duty, our responsibility. But though it's our responsibility, we can execute it with love. And friends, we go back where we begin. The most important reason to keep the commandments of God is what we read earlier. If you love me, keep. There is no greater reason I can give you for keeping God's commandment. Nothing. I mean, I could go into expositions of all the benefits of keeping God's commandments and, and show you this and, and give you examples of people um, who have kept God's commandments and what has happened to them, good and bad, because there are some negative things that happen to people, but they held on. They're looking for Jesus to come. So they're sleeping, waiting. But the best reason I can give you is to love God. You know, friends, um, I was wondering as we, this was the final part of the season, uh, the, the, the series on the law of God. Uh, 11 part series. I didn't know where. First I thought it was 10, then I thought it was 7, then it jumped up to 11. And I was praying to God for what next? And he has convicted me to do the second coming. And so I would encourage you that you start studying along with your personal self. Start studying about the second coming. Read what you can in the spirit of prophecy, the Bible. You know, Just see, because you and I need to be prepared to talk to men and women about his second coming. So I ask for your prayers as I go into studying the second coming to study with us. All right? Let us pray. Father, as I come before you once again, I ask that anything, Lord, and you know I mean this with all my heart, anything I said that I should not have said, remove it from all our minds, all our minds, including mine. Let us not remember my foolishness, Lord, and replace it with that which I should have said. And Lord, anything that I was disobedient in not expounding on as much as I should, then Lord, based on your words, based on your Holy Spirit, Father, I pray, explain it to us in such detail that a little child can understand. Remove, remove from us any form of unholiness. Give us your holiness so that when men and women see us, 
they see you. In Jesus' name, amen.